Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for um, coming to our event tonight um, that we we're holding in partnership with the New South Wales Planning Institute. Um, we're very happy to um, have lined up a, a, an excellent keynote speaker and an excellent panel. So we're hoping for a very active discussion around um, what the Trust thinks is an incredibly important issue. Um, the Trust uh, held a... Um, uh, 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 an event on sort of the same issues, looking at international practice in land rights and planning uh, earlier in the year. Um, uh, Tanya Koneman, who is speaking tonight, um, also spoke at that event. So thanks, Tanya, for um, coming back and um, talking again at the Trust. Uh, it's something that um, for people that were here uh, before the break, um, we're sponsoring some research, a three-year research incubator led by Tess Lee um, that's dealing with some similar issues. We just think this is uh, certainly such an important issue that certainly the university um, shares the trust concern and we're very happy to um, have a good audience and a good panel to really get into uh, this issue tonight. So um, before I begin, I'd just like to um, invite uh, Professor Jacqueline Troy um, to come and do uh, the acknowledgement to country. Thank you, Professor Troy. Well, thank you. Um, it really is a great privilege to be here and to be talking about um, at an event that's about uh, land rights, about the New South Wales Aboriginal Lands Council, um, I uh, feel very humbled, actually, to be asked to do an acknowledgement because I'm acknowledging uh, the country of the Gadigal people, which was stolen from them in 1788 and since then has been developed, not entirely in the way in which the Gadigal would have had in mind, I'm sure, in 1788. Having said that, they are generous people, as are all our peoples, and are working with all of us to... Uh, make sure that this great city that we live in, Sydney, their country, is the wonderful place that it is that welcomes everybody irrespective of creed, colour, language, nationality. I'd like to say something in their language which I had the privilege of working with as a young undergraduate at the University of Sydney. I worked on reconstructing um, the language which is now known in this area as Gadigal, it's also known as Daruk. People talk about being from the Eora Nation. So, Ngaya, Ngawiya, Minga, Gawi, Ngaranya, Ngaya Jaki, Ngaya Ngamichimitong, Snowy Mountains Ngu, Ngaya Bayaba, Gadigoburong, Marinura, Nalawinia, Sydney University Ngu, Jijirigura, Minga, Naraniya. I don't have to translate it because you've got the text up there, but I'm way off country, but uh, my mob used to have a lot to do with people up this way, so it's always a privilege for me to be spending any time in um, this wonderful place and to be back at my university as the Director for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research. And we started this evening with a, a chin wag about just how we might move forward together, um, community and researchers from this university, and I believe this whole event is about that. So. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Professor Troy. Um, now it's um, my, my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for the evening. Uh, it's the CEO of the Metropolitan Land Council, Nathan Moran. Now, Nathan asked me um, specifically to point out that um, he's not a, a, a Gadigal person. Um, He's from up, up north and he belongs to the Birupai and Thangadi mob. So without any further ado, Nathan, would you mind um, coming up to the microphone and providing your comments on this important topic? Not a problem. Well, thankfully I'm mic'd up, so that's the first start. Yep. And it is working, Touchwood. But Juri Gemrua simply means good day in Gadigal. And with the thankfulness and the, the honour to be in the same room as Jacqueline Troy. It's a great privilege to point out that those words and the language that she just spoke in today is right in the middle of being renewed. And thankfully to Jackie and certainly her hard, tireless work and studying here and working with our community and our land council, we've been able to come up with the Sydney Dictionary. 
And when I look around today and knowing in 2017, the National Aboriginal and Islander Day of Observance Committee chose the theme, Languages Matter. How deadly it is to be standing in the first area that language was denied to be spoken and removed from. To be here today to have Jacqueline introduce us and acknowledge country and language, to let alone sh share that with everyone, is so uplifting for our spirits. And I suppose that'll be the, the positive discussion I'll have when I talk about the topic that we have here today. But more importantly, I'd say thanks very much to the Trust and Sydney Uni for organising tonight, more practically Peter and his staff. It's a great pleasure and honour to come in here tonight and speak to you about the interaction of New South Wales land rights and New South Wales planning. Firstly, I'd like to just give a bit of an overview and an introduction to who Metro Land Council is. Looking at that map, you'd think it was Italy. Yeah, I make no mistakes about that's my analogy on Metro Land Council's boundary. It's the boot of Italy on the Sydney Newcastle metro area. That's the boundary that I represent in the council that I work for today at Metropolitan Local Land Council. Yes, we're down here right now, and yes, I have an office in Redfern, but I'm responsible for the Yango National Park, the Durrick National Parks, Mugimara National Parks, Maramara, Garrigal. Sydney Harbour, Lane Cove, that's the context that I work within daily. I work over 22 local government areas. As a legislated authority like local councils, I would suggest to you it's a very inequitable establishment for, for my body and my corporate body to be negotiating and liaising with bodies that are in duplicate of 22 at a minimum. If I was to include Cessnock and Singleton in the north, I'd bring it up to 24. But at the end of the day, land councils established under the Land Rights Act of 1983 are all given roles to represent or foster the best interests of all Aboriginal people in a boundary, and that prescribed boundary is the one you see behind me. Other fundamental roles for the land council, I think the name and the legislation gives it away, is to make claims on vacant Crown land. The Act sets out our ability to make claims on vacant Crown land that is not identified by the New South Wales Government for essential public use. Within the Metropolitan Local Land Council boundaries, we've lodged over 3,000 local land claims. We've only had processed 200. Actually, we just had two the other week, so I lied. It's about 202. That's since 1983 to 2017. And I'll say now in a statewide context, there's been over 32,000 Aboriginal land claims and just under 3,000 have been processed. Which I believe is the, the great challenge that's leading to discussions like we're having tonight on how can we make land rights work, more importantly, how can land rights interact with the planning laws that so directly impacts on land rights? And just to take you back a step and to say to you that from the Land Council's point of view, um, we make claims on vacant Crown land within our boundaries. We cover from that Georges River in the south to the Hawkesbury in the north and out to the Nepean's convergence with the Hawkesbury in the northwest. We have a large, different range of what's known as Crown land. So to introduce to you what Crown land could potentially be, it's anything that remains in the name of the Crown firstly, Given that the Crown started establishing land assets in this area, certainly from 1800 onwards, by the time we got to 1983, I hope you would realise that there wasn't a lot of land remaining in the name of the Crown. But I'm very proud to say that our Land Council, with its ingenuity, its cunning, its guile, its inability to access the Crown land map, not even have the Crown land map shared with us, has still been able to lodge 3,000 land claims and receive 200 of those as freehold title. But in an entirety, entirety as a scale, that's very appalling outcomes. To know that we've been around since 1983, we're going to celebrate our 35th year of operation formally next year, 40 years since the impetus of land rights around Australia started in our backyard, what was known as the Redfern Land Council, at the, at the Aboriginal Dance Theatre site in Cope Street, 
To think that all of that movement was based on the 1938 day of mourning protest in Elizabeth Street, Sydney, that called for rights for our people, that called for citizenship. And of course, in 1938, I clarify the context, citizenship was the highest order of rights any individual could have. Of course, in 1948, they were replaced by the Human Rights Accord, known as the United Nations Convention, which is why we use today the language we want our human rights. But in them days, there were old people in the streets of Sydney risking lock-up, not just risking it, but actually receiving lock-up and the removal of their children on the basis of protesting silently and peacefully in the day of mourning protest. The power and the spirit of those old people to stand on the 150th anniversary of the penal colony, on the very day they were out there to celebrate it, to do a silent but respectful protest in the streets of Sydney is an amazing show of strength. They wrote formally to the New South Wales government and to the local government then, it was known as City of Sydney, or Sydney Council in them days, sorry, not City of Sydney Council today, but Sydney Council, and asked for access to the Town Hall of Sydney to convene a meeting of Aboriginal people and the Prime Minister, Mr Lyons, of the day. Mr Lyons thankfully did confirm he wanted to attend and he did indeed attend. But unfortunately, of course, history shows we were denied access to the Sydney Town Hall. The only communities that allowed us to meet and to proceed with that gathering were the Hellenic communities, the Germanic communities and the Itale communities. They run what was known as the Australia Hall at Elizabeth Street. The first theatre in Australia, the first picture theatre, the first place where shows and plays were shown, run by the Germans and the Itales and the Greeks. We know the irony as First Nations Australians that only those ethnic Australians would allow us to be us. I'm very thankful today to say through land rights, but we now take care and custodianship of that very building. But knowing with that backdrop that in 1938, people from as far away as Palawa people, Tasmanians, Noongars in WA, Yongus, Arantas in Central and Northern Australia, Nungas in South Australia, Murrays in Queensland, Kurris all the way from Victoria converged into Sydney, joined forces and formed the Progressive Society to fight for our rights. I would have thought that by the time 1983 come along, that we might have had a better environment to operate in. But I acknowledge, only New South Wales and NT have land rights. NT, of course, got those in, 19, in the mid-1970s for the movement continuing from the 1938 day of mourning protest through into the 1960s for the referendum cause. There was a movement going and we had national assemblies occurring in Uluru, ironically. Unfortunately, at one of those national conventions at the NAC, the Commonwealth Government decided to grant land rights to the Northern Territory, and only the Northern Territory. And that backdrop to say to you what grad sadness was passed on to me by those who attended that day, included my grandfather, felt that that was the division that really stopped that national unity going forward to get national land rights. That's how close we come. But I'm proud to say that our mob in the East Coast, and certainly New South Wales mob specifically, come back from the NAC conference and obviously did not stop. They actually formed the Redfern Local Land Council. And it voluntarily established itself and commenced in Redfern. And it called for the establishment of a voluntary state Aboriginal land council. And we're just about to celebrate 40 years now since that voluntary state land council was formed in 1978 at Cope Street. So I think it's very important that you get that backdrop to who I represent today. We're known as one of the leaders, if not the leaders, at a local land council level in Australia. We're very proud to say that amongst our membership, our founding chairperson, voluntary chairperson, is a very esteemed person. That's Mr Paul Coe. Our first formal chairperson is another esteemed man in Mr Solly Blair. Preeminent leaders in our community and our society. Law, media, communications, government relations, they've led the way. And it's with that backdrop, I suppose, that I talk here today and I pass on to you the reality that they pass on to me. That land rights has not achieved what it could have achieved. And at the baseline, it's about not seeing land claims being processed, assessed, determined, let alone granted. 
We acknowledge in land rights the great battle of not having resources in the Act. It does not provide us too many resources. I'm a large Category 1 or Tier 1 land council. In 120 land councils across the state, they all think I'm ridiculously rich and empowered, along with a few brothers and sisters north and south and west of me from Dark and Jung in the north, Gandangara in the direct southwest, and Darubin in the direct west. Everyone perceives that we're mega land councils, we're tier one. On a practical sense, what does that give us? It gives us $143,000 to represent all of our roles as described in the Land Rights Act. The only other benefit that we can receive, can receive and could receive, is land claims. And unfortunately, when you've only had 202 of them processed in your favour, that's not a really good resource to rely upon. But I'd say there's a great, great success story amongst land rights, seeing Aboriginal people make this work, to continue this movement. And I'm very proud to say our land council, like all land councils, are businesses. We have to function, we have to meet the financial and fiscal realities of all public authorities. And only twice in our 35 years have we ever come to a financial imposition that we had to have an administrator come in. Which is what I'll lead to now and say, has been a contributor to our model for operating land rights. Our first model was based on get land, sell land and operate. And unfortunately, the administrator who came in in 2010 all but confirmed that failed model. They sell assets to pay financial debt. They don't set you up into the future. They don't talk about your longevity. They don't assess your capabilities. He didn't lodge a land claim. I'm very thankful that the State Land Council did, but and I know I've got one of them sitting in the room tonight who was part of that. But that's the sort of tragedy that we inherit as a system. But when we're running the system ourselves, free of everyone else, in our own ability and on our own accords, we get 143,000 in 2017. We used to get about 100,000 in about 2000, Jeff. Sorry for out in the former CEO of the local land council network, the State Land Council. Mr Jeff Scott, a proud Wiradjuri man, someone who I've known and been a mentor for me for years, I'd affirm to say to you, we've never really got much resources to run our business. I can remember the dire circumstances of my community in Biripai, that in 1993 our total allocation was $60,000. But we were dealing with three local government areas stretched from as far as the North Brother Mountain up to, up to Kempsey, on the, in the Crescent Heads area, out to Walker. Literally hundreds of thousands of kilometres that we had to cover with $60,000. So they're the resources. The only other issue I should draw your attention to is our responsibility to protect, preserve, protect and promote all culture and heritage in our boundary. I'm proud to say that we've got 4,500 registered Aboriginal sites in the boot of Italy today working with OEH or yesterday's National Parks and Wildlife. We are out there every day of the week conducting site assessments, culture and heritage assessments, reports for culture and heritage preservation and protection and campaigning for the return of areas that are of culture and heritage significance. So I've got to point out that in some of our land claims of the 202, we've been very lucky. Not just from that economic vision, but from the cultural point of view of the Act, that we have got very intrinsically cultural value sites back. We've got astronomy sites that have been returned to us. Some of the best astronomy sites in the great island known of Australia has. Those that depict the stories of the Milky Way or what's known as the Emu Dream and to our mob. Also what's known as the series that creates the understanding of how the phases of the moon and the great creation story about Biami, the creator of the night sky, is also depicted on an Aboriginal land claim. But I'd have to say to you, that's where the positives stop. My practical reality is now trying to realise the benefits that the Land Rights Act was established for. When Frank Walker introduced the legislation, he used the language that they were legislating the Land Rights Act to compensate us for the loss of the state of New South Wales. And I've got to tell you, as a young fellow who was, had a mother who was caught up in the system and in and around the system, for me it was just a lot of talk by a lot of people.
But as I got older and I understood that and progressed through primary school into high school and read the Act myself, I realised it's a pretty good ethos, it's a pretty good challenge for everyone, isn't it? That if we had land rights established to compensate us for the loss of New South Wales, and that's the introduction to it and that's the background to it, this should work pretty good. It's been supported by both Labor and Liberal, all parties, shooters, Greens, Christian Democrats, you name any political party out there, no one opposed land rights when it come in. But from that moment of joy and support across the board and everyone supporting it, it has not had that same success. At a grassroots level, lodging a land claim to the Registrar of the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, who today is a much more better empowered and resourced body. But I would say to you from 1983, lodging a land claim to them was then to run to the Crown Lands Office to get a hard copy of a Crown Land map to work out if the land you claim was even Crown Land. To then find out from Crown Lands if it has any leases, licences that exist on it that could prevent us from making a claim because it has to be vacant to be a land claim. Created a huge problem, a nightmare. And I still remember myself as a child being dragged into Crown Land offices. My mob were a bit different in the north. We had the power of demographics. We're a larger population around Kempsey and Taree of general population. Kempsey has a, the beauty of having 50% of the local government are Aboriginal. So we were able to converse in strong numbers and head to the Crown Land office at Taree, knock on the front door of the office. I remember vividly the old people walking in, introducing and saying, Hi, we're your local land councils. You're the Crown Land Office. Where's your Crown Land maps? We're here to get them. And they physically stripped them out of the office. And I know that only successes has occurred in land rights from our people's willingness and boldness to go and get the required resources to do the job. You cannot lodge claims if you don't know what you're claiming. You can lodge them, but it becomes frivolous, it becomes administratively a nightmare, it becomes costly and it becomes a burden on everyone. But unfortunately that's the, the start of land rights and where we were forced into and how it came about that we have now the public known record from the New South Wales Government as at 2015 that they still have nearly 30,000 claims of 33,000 claims to resolve. So for my local land council, I can't say it's just my local land council who suffers. It's across the board. Whether you're in Tipperborough, you're in Tweed Heads, you're in Eden or you're in Bal Reynold, or you're in Parks, whether you're in the centre of the state, the far west, the far north, the far east or the far south, the same system exists. Local land councils make claims on vacant Crown land. And it's here I'll introduce to you what I understand to be my greatest administrative challenge. How do I make claims on vacant Crown land when I know that the only other person who has a right to claim it is the local government? So, only two authorities can claim Crown land, local government, local land councils. So what we have is this unavoidable contestability that starts with land rights. There's only a certain amount of land that remains in the Crown. The local government wishes to do what it wants to do for its community needs and likes to seek out all available Crown land. But unfortunately, it's their other role in the planning instruments that really stops us from going forward. As you'd all be aware, talking to the converted, it's the local councils that determine the planning laws. Have things like local environmental planning. You must submit your local council the development application to develop land. So I'll give you an example that I'd share with anyone. Our greatest problem is where we can test for vacant Crown land, make a claim to Crown lands, to then be granted the claim in a very rare situation, like I said, 202 out of literally thousands, we get it granted. The title arrives in the mail. Hopefully sometime someone from Crown land will hand deliver it to you. Maybe they might have to give you a key to the access gate and they say good luck to you and they leave you. 
At that moment, we're a legal landowner. We're responsible for all the liabilities like every landowner in this country, from public liability insurance, maintaining and, and preserving and protecting access rights to that land, attending to issues of invasive plant species, illegal dumping of land. So we become burdened straight away. We don't get any assets when we're given land claims. The Act actually says that we will utilise land to be, the, to be really our recompense, in my words, but we will utilise land holdings to form an ability to provide community benefits. In essence, today in the Land Rights Act, we utilise land to run our business. The business is run by a community land and business plan. Within the business plan, we identify what benefits and the benefit schemes, it's called the community benefit schemes, will you run, will you manage financially, effectively throughout your business plan? The only way I'm going to get income to deliver benefits to my community is by utilising land. While some of us are creative, and certainly the council I work with, are very creative on how we create income, the New South Wales Land Council grant only amounts to 20% of my total operational income every year. Touch wood, it continues. Because if it didn't, I wouldn't be even be able to be here tonight, to have the resources to come here tonight. But what my greatest problem is, I have two land claims that my community have identified the potential to seek benefits from through developing. We have local land councils responsible for identifying what particular land claims or parcels would they like to utilise for developments. The Act is very onerous on us. It requires 80% of local land council members to approve a land dealing or a contract to enter for sailing, leasing or licensing of land beyond three years. I know no other comparable business who needs 80% of their members or decision makers to approve something to be a decision. Usually it's 51%. Sometimes it's 50 with the casting vote of a chair or a president. But unfortunately there's very tough rules on how we use our land and we go through that and in our case we've done it twice. Certainly in 2005 and recently in 2010. Those two development two developments that we had approval from our members had to be approved by our state body. We have to send out under the Land Rights Act copies of our minutes, presentations from the proposed partners who we're doing the joint venture development with in our particular case. All of that information is sent to the State Land Council who does diligence tests on it, then forwards it up to the State Land Council board who make a determination as to whether you can go ahead for a land early. Once you've done all those steps, you are run a marathon. You've probably run two marathons. You've double-checked, you've double-cross-checked everything from presenting to a local board who recommend to go up to the local land council, then double-checking what you send to the state land council, and then hopefully you get back an approval certificate to commence. Well, we got that twice. And I'm sure my community at the time that I represent today in the first one thought, yay, we're underway. The reality is, we submitted a development application to the then Warringah Local Council to develop lands at Morgan's Road that was ex-farm land from the soldier settlement return farm plots. For those who aren't aware, a lot of Crown land is actually under lease to ex-soldiers who unfortunately, uh, right or wrongly, have acquired great wealth on the basis of being given Crown land. In this case, only two of those soldiers remained on the land and all the remaining land around it was vacant at the time of the claim. So nonetheless, we were successful in getting a large land holding in Morgan's Road. To assist in the discussion, I'll, I'll just drill down to Morgan's Road and say to you, Morgan's Road, it, it, is, it is a fantastic land holding. We're surrounded by Communication towers from the bottom here. Aged care, aged care, aged care, aged care, private landowner, private landowner, private landowner, private landowner, private landowner. 
private landowner, private landowner. We submitted to develop up to 400 residential developments of townhouses, a mixture of houses and townhouses, on the western side of Snake Creek, because pointing out there's a cultural side here that we could never ever affect. But to propose that we could utilise this area for a land development. We put in the application. The Warringah local government determined that it could not support the application despite the existing zoning permitting aged care on it and mixed use. They chose not to support or approve our development application. Bugger that. We're not alone, so I confess a lot of landowners and property developers face that problem. I'm sure you are aware of that. Local government knocks it back for whatever reason. We then appealed to the state government. And there was a guy named Frank who used to be the mayor somewhere once. And he was sometime what the planning minister for New South Wales. So we exercised our right, like all people, to write to him and ask him to take over this application on the basis that we feel it's not being fairly treated or dealt with. Unfortunately, despite his recommendation that it be approved, the then government, state government, chose not to approve it. And it still sits vacant today. We still pay rates. We still have to service all the invasive plants. We still have to deal with all the illegal dumping from all of our kind, friendly neighbours over that way. But unfortunately, not utilising it and not getting a benefit from it since the members have determined that in 2005, 12 years now we've been waiting to utilise something. That's a hard, hard story. The other development that our Land Council is now pursuing and has since 2010, which is now on public exhibition, is probably the greatest example of how we are discriminated against as a local Land Council. The area is known as Rolston Avenue. Rolston Avenue adjoins the Garrigal National Park here. It has the Sydney East substation here. The actual land holding goes from the Belrose tip right around the fringes to the bottom here and it joins back onto Carroll Crescent. We're proposing to use, literally where that hand is, 13% of the land mass. We're going to save 87% of that land, preserve it for community benefits, from ecology benefits, bushwalking, mountain bike riding on the fire trails, just for people to enjoy serenity, country. And use 13% in that very area there only to develop 150 residential lots for sale. We have just recently completed the public exhibition comments period. We've had over 600 comments relayed to us. 90% oppose our proposed development on the basis variances but most commonly we have is a fear that it will lead to increased traffic for these local residents. We are proposing to connect that road wide avenue to this avenue here, Rolston Avenue, to give them an interconnected road that would allow additional bus services, community access, more importantly to address another concern that's been raised, potential fire. Being on the edge of a national park, we don't deny that there's potential for fire. But when we have engaged the most preeminent fire expert in Australia to undertake the study, who's done the study, who's designed, well, had a look at the design of the proposal, undertaken the assessment of, of the gradients for the land, the potential and likelihood for a fire, understanding that 87% will be a buffer around the 13%, he, he has recommended that it should be approved based on the requirements of New South Wales laws for bushfires. The APZs, as they call them, that we had a sufficient plan for a fire protection zone for our design. The local government chose to engage a bushfire expert with a local knowledge from Morewell in Victoria, who has put forward a public submission now, the Northern Beaches government, local government, 
to say that they believe that their report by their expert identifies something that's never occurred in our state and it's called ARCI. That the electrical substation will somehow cause a bushfire in the reverse option that rather than the fire coming off here onto there, it would start here from some potential heat wave situation and spark a fire on the land next to it which would burn all of us down. When we seen that submission from the Northern Beaches government, we asked for a freedom of information request on their engagement of the consultant. We were lucky enough to uncover that the Rural Fire Service Commissioner had actually recommended this person in the quiet to the local government. On that basis, we, we determined that it's probably best we utilise alternate options, like Lizard Rock. We wrote to the Sydney East Planning Panel and said that we feel that we're being discriminated against by a local government authority who is not actually assessing our development on its merits, but is actually raising issues that has never been raised nor identified by anyone in our process. In fact, by someone they engaged after the closure of that process. Thankfully, the New South Wales government said we see merit in it after we paid $15,000 to the New South Wales Planning Department they said they'd assess the development application. That was in 2014, that they would do it under the undertaking it would be done in no more than 12 months. In 2017, in February, I finally met with the Department of Planning who assures me they're going to finalise the assessment. So, what I would say to you and to anyone who wanted to know why land councils are struggling or not achieving as they potentially could the benefits of their land value is because we're being subject to submitting development applications for land that we've gotten for recompense for the stealing of our country, but we have to submit back to the very authorities who compete with us to get the land for the authority to develop the land. And I should point out that we have on records an offer from the Northern Beaches Council for $7 million to buy that land. The VG valuation's 18, just quietly. So we knock that back. In that backdrop, we just don't see why we have to deal with someone who's shown their hand to want the land put forward that it should be netball courts. Thankfully, that's not an essential public use under the Act, and therefore we got the claim. Then offered us $7 million to buy it, even though it's worth 18. We knocked it back. Anyone would. Anyone, anyone alive still, I'm sure, would do that. Maybe a famous movie called Weekend at Bernie's may sign off on it, <laughs> or someone else would sign off for them. No one in their right mind is going to accept a land offer under the valuation. Our laws don't even permit that, quite frankly. So I'm very proud to say we told them, no, go away. Unfortunately, the person who made that offer was the administrator, is now currently the new administrator of the amalgamated Northern Beaches Council. He went from the administrator of Warringah Local Government to the administrator of the Northern Beaches combined Pitwater Warringah and Manly local governments. So once again, in the process of going through the state government, they asked the local government to give them some feedback on our proposal. Naturally, the administrator wrote he does not support it because it's fire in a report that we have attached. Well, thankfully, we inform the planning and the planning secretary, Mr Marcus Ray, that's ironic. We've got a freedom of information request here that shows that um, they engaged him after the closing period for comments. More importantly, we've got a copy of an offer from that same administrator to buy the land. Less than 50% of its actual value. But more importantly, they were forced to give comments for a voluntary planning agreement. And thank God they did. They asked for 50% of the profit of the proposed development if it was to go ahead. 
All public records. God, I love it when people are that stupid, they put it in writing. More importantly, I'm so proud they didn't check the New South Wales laws when they had the recommendation from an ex-planning person from ACT government, make the recommendation you should seek half of the profit of the sales under the voluntary planning agreement. So we asked for, where's that a precedence in New South Wales? Do you have any? And of course, Mr Marcus Ray confirmed he's not aware of any. In fact, no one's aware of any local government asking any developer to take 50% of their profit. We made $12 million worth of voluntary offers for community benefits, from building recreational parks, having a walking route around it, connecting the roads, preserving an area for a sport recreation field or community park. That was all valued at over $12 million, but they said, no, nah, that won't do, we want half the profit. So, for my land council to go ahead, if I can't realise value out of my land claims, my greatest asset of value, and at a bottom line figure, I can't address an imbalance of 99% non-liquidity for my business, I've got a very dangerous future. Land councils are land rich, but if we can't utilise that land, maybe not even get the claims assessed, I'd say it'd be better first up, but then what you have can't even be dealt fairly and equitably to return a benefit to your community, it brings into disrepute the entire system. And unfortunately, that's where land rights is today, but on a positive side, New South Wales government, as you may be aware, have announced that there's Aboriginal land negotiation agreements taking place. And they announced that there's four pilots to commence it. From the bottom of the pile or the short straw at the top, Metro Land Council was chosen. Ironically, the area we were chosen to negotiate with? Northern Beaches local government. <laughs> Don't you love it? So just this Tuesday, I sat in a room for the first time that I believe has occurred certainly in Metro Land Councils, if not outside of those other pilots ever in land rights history. We've got access to the New South Wales Government's Crown Land Database and mapping. We can see every licence and every use of land since it was first titled. From Torrens title to freehold title. Every neighbour around us. That's an amazing resource that really saddens me to think, what could we have done if we had this since 1983? Meeting Tuesday, I was able to watch them scan over and go real quick and say, oh, here's an introductory to it, and that's the colour, and I clarified, is that your colour scheme on the left? So does yellow mean it's still crowned with no claim? Oh, great. So when they flicked through, they went flick, 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 and then they went down around here to Narwina, and they went, oh, and they were flicking, and I seen... Was that yellow? Oh. So we went through the meeting and my chair patiently sat and when they left she said, did you see where that yellow was? And I said, yeah, no, nah, Wiener. It actually adjoins a land claim. The licence just ran out for the user of the land. So thankfully in 2010 when the State Land Council committed resources to help us and local land councils in Jeff's time, that we had that support at the State Land Council and we had resources to look at data mapping, we were able to make effective claims in 2010 like no other time period. But what we don't get is when is that lease or licence going to expire and become Crown Land again? So that, for me, shows that we still have a long way to go. That the Land Council should not have to wait by stealth or chance to see something pop up on a screen to realise there's an ability for us to lodge Crown land claims on it. I really hope one day that New South Wales, all of us, Gurries, Kurries, Murrays, Gubbas, the whole lot of us collectively as a state, own our history, but more importantly, start setting up a future for everyone. No one on the planet Earth has had their land taken from them without recompense. No one on the land of Australia is going to sit back idly and watch people lot off, sell off and use our land and create economic benefits that we see no benefit from. 
And while I wish to bring to people's attention that New South Wales has the greatest rights system in this country for Aboriginal people, we just got to make it work. And that requires goodwill on both sides, the legislators and the powers that be that is government. It's great to give us an act, it's great to give it a title called land rights, but it's not actually land rights unless you get some rights on that land. If it only turns into goat rights, that you only have access rights after you negotiate with a near neighbour to walk through their property to get to your land, it ain't a right. It's a problem. It's a liability. And I really hope that through this land negotiation process and the new review of the Land Rights Act, we can change that environment that unfortunately we've lived through. And certainly acknowledging land rights has had some spears thrown at it after it was started. Whether it was Nick Griner's 1989 proposal to abolish land rights, or whether it was the Bob Carr government's removal of 200 million from our rental income, known as land tax, and removing land tax so that we have no income to land rights today, we've had everyone try and undo what was done. And I really hope we get back to that impetus of 83 when everyone was in unison supporting land rights to overcome social and historical disadvantage for the first humans of this land known as New South Wales. Through land rights, but I've got to say, I'm here tonight. So there's many benefits that have occurred by having an authority. But what I want to draw your attention to is partnerships that really make change. The discussions that I'm having here tonight has come from a discussion I had with Peter. Peter had the privilege of presenting to La Perouse Land Council and Metro Land Council to give us an overview on what do you know about planning laws. I didn't reveal I'm a property manager by trade and an ex-law student, I just sat there dumb. My cousin Christopher Ingray, he just sat there ning. Christopher's got an, an enormous background of growing up on the reserve there, his dad being a founding member out there and Chris knows his reserve like no other. But what Chris was sitting on was they had a development application proposal or seeking a development application hopefully one day but a proposal for an Aboriginal aged care facility on their land that unfortunately the local government out there won't stop using and give back control of to the local land council who's actually the owner of it. So they've gerrymandered, falsely claimed land and are using land that's not theirs, it's the La Perouse Land Council's land. They have a dire need for aged care facilities and needs. Unfortunately, but the local government out there doesn't seem to care diddly squat. So that was the example Peter first heard. And then I sat back and said, which one? Mm. Ralston Avenue, all right. I've got a development that's going ahead currently. I've had to take it off the local government, put it up to the state government. And it was through those discussions that Peter said, would you be interested in coming and talking with some of my students? And I said to him, not just interested in talking to them, I'm interested how can I get your students and your colleagues to work with us to overcome our inadequacy of resourcing to try and look at how can I get your expertise in planning to have a look at my land listings that conveniently, when titles are given over or land claims are done, they just conveniently leave out the current zoning. So we have to work that out in partnership with our state land council. We have to go onto the local land local environmental plans to find out what are the zonings for land claims. But when you're a local land council and when you're a mega rich council like me in Metro and you're able to afford six full-time staff, one of them's at Camp Wallamai at St Albans, one of them's at Waratah Park looking after Skippy, leaves me four. I'm one of the four. Then I've got one at reception and then I've got a cultural officer. And then I've got a cultural educator. We don't have the resources to have full-time land and property officers on with us. We use a casual arrangement for our land and properties because we don't have the income to be able to do that. And we don't see how it's actually returning benefits to us yet. But I know with my heart, my spirit, more importantly, my learnings on law and understandings of uh, the use of land in this country, it's the greatest commodity that exists in Australia. It's land, soon to be replaced by water, but don't tell anyone. 
So at this point in time, if I don't get some benefits from my land, I've left my people in no better position than when I inherited the role. So it's my great challenge to try and take up with Peter a discussion and then rock up to his student group and say, would anyone like to come and do some placements or some voluntary work at my council? Because, geez, I'd love some planning knowledge to go through my land listing. Not only tell me the current zonings, but maybe have a look cunningly at what's my neighbours. Do I have a different zoning? Because I can tell you at Wellington Street in Kalara, where there's a bowling club that we own, it was rezoned from commercial residential to environmental when it was granted to us. So if we don't have planning skills and people to assist us to put in submissions to try and address this, I'll call it blatant racism, I'll call it institutionalised racism, to try and stop us from moving forward, I don't see us moving forward unless we get planning skills. Very vital for local land councils. They see some rights to that land and the only way they're going to do that is with skilled people like yourselves who have an understanding of the planning system that can help us to not waste our time trying to develop land that's undevelopable, will probably never be developed because it's got high ecological values or whatever the issue, but really assist us to identify quickly how can we start getting benefits like income from our land. It will only happen through things like Sydney University partnering up with our land council to start bringing over students to do voluntary work and placements with us to assist us to look at that 202 land holdings we have and look at the potential of those holdings to allow me to have informed discussions with my board and members on what potential other land developments or licences or leases could we enter or pursue. Without the expertise, we'll go nowhere. But again, I'd like to thank Peter, the Trust, Sydney University for having us here tonight. I look forward to working with Sydney University on this partnership of having planning students working with us because I know by the end of it, and certainly I hope there is no end of it, I hope it's a long-term thing, because we're going to be here forever. We've got no plans to move anywhere else. We're going to utilise that land asset and I'm going to see some benefits of my $120 million land asset to become some por portion, if not the completion of a liquidity that will allow us to sustain ourselves in perpetuity. We make no bones about it. We've learned that sell to operate doesn't work. We know what does work, putting it in trust, putting it in long-term investments and running from dividends. And that's what my council wishes to do and I look forward to doing it in partnership with Sydney Uni and getting the help from the planning students here. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks. Oh, no. Okay, thanks very much for that, um, that, that, that incredibly um, in, in, interesting and passionate address, Nathan. Um, I'd like to um, just invite up to um, the front chairs. We, we've got a, a, a panel. We've assembled a panel tonight that are going to provide some responses to Nathan. Um, first off, we've got Tanya Koneman. Tanya is working um, on uh, an Aboriginal planning program uh, and resource program in the Department of Planning. Um, so uh, Tanya is going to speak um, first. Ne ne next to Tanya, we have Jenny Rudolph. Jenny is the president of New South Wales Pier and also a planning consultant who works um, for Elton's Planning. And you know, we really um, appreciate the help of the Planning Institute. Uh, in holding this event tonight. We've also got a real life planner in terms of um, Louise Kerr, who's from the city of Sydney. And um, next to Louise on the end, we have Adrian Keane, who's one of my colleagues, who's been helping to organise the student placement program at Metro um, Land Council. And thanks for the shout out about that, Nathan. So um, I'm just going to hand um, Tanya a microphone to get uh, things rolling. Um, each of the panel is going to give um, some short reactions to um, Nathan's address, maybe say a little bit about um, some of their own organisation's idea if they're representing an organisation, and um, then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today on Gadigal land. Uh, I'm from La Perouse. So I think it's only appropriate that um, I pay the proper cultural respects. Um, I would like, as um, Peter said, I'm working for Department of Planning and Environment, and I head up what's called the Aboriginal Cultural, uh, the Aboriginal Community Land and Infrastructure Planning Team. 
ACLIP, we call it. And I would like to thank Nathan for his, his um, clarity and his forthrightness in what he said. What he said is, is a, a bit of a potted version of what was said over months through two parliamentary inquiries that related to Aboriginal um, community, Aboriginal economic development in communities as well as the um, planning processes, um, or the, the processes for regional planning. So a lot of the issues that... that That's what I need. Your mic's still on. Um, so, yeah, look, I just wanted to thank Nathan, first of all, for what he said, because what he has said has echoed around the state. We have been, our team have been talking to people all over New South Wales, um, most of them land councils, but also there is Aboriginal community-owned land that are owned, that's owned by um, Aboriginal corporations. Uh, and I've been working now with Department of Planning for 18 months, um, brought on specifically to address this issue and to try and build a bit of a team around things. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate given, I don't know how much time we've got in the, the group here, so I guess um, I don't want to sort of reel off a laundry list of what we've been busy doing, but I guess it's worth noting that uh, some of the, the points that Nathan made were around the provision of information which is something that Nathan rightly says Aboriginal people have had to fight for. Um, it's a bit of a closed club there in terms of you, if you want to dominate a group of people, you, you, you keep them on a, on a drip feed of information. So one of, the, um, one of the principles, I guess, that we've looked at in doing the work we're doing with planning um, in addressing this is to open that up and to provide um, mapping to look at uh, strategic assessment of Aboriginal community owned land um, as an opt-in approach for land councils. I know Metro are quite keen to, to take up that option. Um, it, it's true that a lot of land councils not only aren't aware of what land is claimable, but the land that they have claimed, it's never actually been mapped in a lot of cases. So knowing where it is, what it joins onto, what the planning layers of information are around that, that's something that is a, a bit of a mystery. And while it's all publicly available, as Nathan said, there's there's no capacity for most, commun for most land councils to actually access that information. A lot of land councils um, do crisis management and they, they have to prioritise things um, based on the, the latest thing that is, is happening within that community and it's usually around a lot of the social services. So um, we're working really hard to provide information about strategic land use. Um, the other thing worth saying that has come about is that planning in Aboriginal communities, like land use planning, the profession of planning is just not a thing. We have not been able to find an Aboriginal planner who has graduated from a New South Wales planning course to come and work for us. We've had some Aboriginal planners put their hand up and say, well, I'd like to do this, um, but they've all been trained in other states. And when I say all, I think there's like three. Um, <laughs> yeah, so let's not <laughs> gild the lily. Um, so the, the point of that is that planning has no profile. It's one of those professions that people, especially in, in our communities, just don't think about because it was all done by a select few behind closed doors. And they were usually sort of, you know, rich white men in suits a lot of the time, historically. Um, so, it, you know, hitting on that information provision thing, we've, we've been trying to address that. The other really important point is that um, relationship building. So a lot of the, the toing and froing that goes on is a legacy of um, historical events, how local government and Aboriginal communities have had um, a forced relationship through various laws and planning laws aren't immune to that or, you know, it, 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 it's a cause and effect issue. So one of the, the key sort of approaches that we've also got is that whatever we're doing, we have to look at how does this contribute to better relationships between the Aboriginal land councils and the planning authorities. So that's not just a... So what we're looking at is cultural awareness, not in terms of... Um, what most people perceive to be cultural awareness, but it's around letting people know about these issues. This is also a part of the culture that we've had to survive in and live in. 
So um, we're looking at um, cultural awareness training for planning staff. Um, and I call it developing cultural competency because a lot of people will talk about the need to develop um, or build capacity in Aboriginal communities. Aboriginal communities are quite capable if given the opportunity to basically, you know, as, as Nathan said, um, run their own race. So one of the points that I've made, though, is that even where you have an Aboriginal land council take to a planning authority, whether it be state or local, um, a planning uh, proposal or an aspiration, most of the time that planning authority doesn't have the cultural competency to deal with it because they're not keyed up on um, service delivery for Aboriginal communities. It's sort of like, well, this is our process, this is what you do, whether it suits you or not, or whether there are other um, things impacting on that or not, such as the Land Rights Act. So, um, yeah, we're very big on trying to look at relationships. Um, and I guess the, the main, one of the main issues, the third main issue is around unlocking that economic benefit, that, that the potential that sits within these land holdings. Uh, and that is about making sure that we've identified the right levers to make available to Aboriginal land councils um, so that there is good policy in place, good legislation in place that can actually go some way towards um, addressing these issues. So I'll leave it at that because I, I could talk for days um, and I'll just pass over the microphone. Thanks, Peter. Do you want to? Um, thank you. Thank you very much um, for um, inviting Pierre here today. Um, I represent Pierre, the president of New South Wales. Um, also, I'm proud that at Alton Consulting we have done some work for the Aboriginal councils and that's where I met um, Nathan. I've got a couple of slides which I thought, I won't, I won't necessarily really take you through everything, but I think it's really important because of where we're sitting in our history in New South Wales, that I just let you know about what some of the things that PR are doing and what we'd like to do, what some of the options that we're doing, which kind of addresses what um, Nathan has said. And, Welcome any inputs and thoughts because we're on the journey here with you. So I'm not going to go through everything, but just one of the key things um, is at the moment for this next financial year, the Peer National Board has identified that um, Aboriginal planning is, or Indigenous planning, is one of the key drivers that we need to do something. We can't just sit back and wait anymore like we tried in 2011 and 2012. Um, we've got some more resources now, so we do need to participate and to, um, take part in it. One of those that we have started with the unis is um, trying to look at bringing in and accrediting um, Aboriginal planning, Indigenous planning, Indigenous heritage as part of a planning course. And we're working with all the unis at the moment to try and build that in so that there's a greater awareness so we can get the attraction, we can get the knowledge out there of different people. I'm going to quickly go through quite quickly, so hopefully this will... Um, um, help you out. Um, we, as I mentioned, we advocate that there does need to be change and the time is right now for the change and we need to do all of those kind of things that I've mentioned. As planners though, um, I think what we need to do is to start to look at and understand what is the economic, what is the social and uh, cultural and physical um, policy issues, um, planning issues, where we can actually support the growth and development, capacity building and resourcing of um, Aboriginal planning. And here's just a thought process that we started to put together about, well, what are the statutory requirements from a planning perspective? What are the issues? Who's involved? And what we're going to try and do, and I'd love you to join us in it, is work through this in a little bit more of a detailed way so that we can actually start to make a difference in the rezoning process, in the policy process, or in the development application process. Um, Alton Consulting also does work in Northern Territory, so we do a lot of um, planning. So if I can say from that point of view, we do know that it's very different in the Northern Territory compared to in New South Wales. But, and from that in the context, we know that there's different needs, whether there's remote communities, if there's urban communities, um, or if there's regional communities. Each of those um, uh, communities, Aboriginal communities, Torres Strait Islanders communities, have different needs. And we think as planners and with peer, we need to take a table like this and say, well, where are they? What are their needs? 
Uh, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And what are the planning responses? We think that's a prudent point and position to take, which will then start to help um, uh, what issues some of that Nathan was looking at. A lot more closely um, to home, though, um, what we're starting to consider as options, we've actually been starting to talk to the department about it and um, had a meeting with the minister as well, um, that we think that as part of the planning reforms, there should be something in the Act. Recently, Queensland in the Northern Territory, they've got um, objects in the Act and some clarifications in the Act. We think New South Wales should have that point of view and position. To deal exactly with what um, Nathan has been saying, we think that at the district plans initially, that there should be a lot more strategic planning. At the strategic planning level, having a look at the Crown lands as part of any other plan, as part of any other vision of the area, and coming up strategically with what those parcels of land should actually be to be able to give economic and social benefits. We also think that um, the, in the community plans, uh, the community consultation plans, which are coming in as part of the reforms, that um, the Aboriginal land councils in particular should be part of those processes, when, how, who, um, as part of the, the consultation processes, should be included like any other authority, like any other um, peak group that there is, any other council that there is um, across any kind of development. So we're going to be really um, working on that quite hard. Um, and to, um, we think that the best option at the moment, what we can see, love your views on this, is that um, the, local, the local authorities, if there's a rezoning or development application, they actually be to initially change the mindset, change the perception, get the policy right, get the strategy right, is actually um, have a specific SEP um, for, the, for the Crown lands which are dealing with whether there's claims made or claims granted or claims that are incomplete. Let's have a look at it so that it can be dealt with in a fair and equitable manner in line with um, all the policies, the district plans, but as well as taking into consideration the normal things, whether it's traffic or transport or, or um, infrastructure or heritage or geotech or contamination. We need to consider those in the broader context, but we do think a specific SEP initially, like you've got some of the specific SEPs that we have in New South Wales, will get that process going. And obviously we think that there's something about affordable housing where we need to actually include, in particular, um, some communities or some Aboriginal housing communities in that to be able to provide the affordable housing. So those are some of the things that we've started to think of um, to try and work in or deal with some of the things that Nathan is thinking of. Love your discussion, love your, to hear your views um, and look forward to working with the land councils and with peer to actually try and make a real difference this time, not the 2010-11 um, difference which we tried to make then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Thank I you. think Jenny's covered most of the points that I was going to raise from a local government perspective. Um, but what I can say is that it's probably fair to say that local government doesn't have a good history um, in dealing with um, Aboriginal um, issues and particularly land councils. And what was, I suppose, um, pertinent for me, and I actually hadn't turned my mind to it, was the inherent conflict of interest that local councils do have when dealing with... Um, with yeah, land claims and then the subsequent um, applications that follow that. So I think the state government needs to look at resolving that inherent conflict of interest that does exist um, and perhaps it's a matter for uh, a, a separate authority being the consent authority when it comes to planning issues um, on those things, on those you know, projects. Um, so like Tanya and Jenny, um, the cultural awareness training of planners in local government is in important and imperative and there's not a lot of training at universities um, and as at a start we need to ensure that planners have got the adequate training so I would hope that local government the Department of Planning and PEER will work together in getting a um, accreditation program together where then councils can take that on um, to ensure that there's a competency framework when we employ planners so that we understand the issues um, both in the strategic planning and the development application processes. Um, Another area where I think we can improve is obviously building collaborative relationships with 
the um, Aboriginal land councils. At the City of Sydney, we, um, we do promote diversity and inclusion within our community. And we, um, in 2008, appointed our first Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander advisory panel, of which Nathan is a part of. Um, that panel um, has, been, has worked quite successfully with the council, but I'll be the first to say that we don't generally have good discussions in relation to planning or development decisions. Um, and I think a starting point will be for us to work with that advisory panel to try and and um, get community engagement plans and participation um, together so that they, we can all work together on zoning issues and DA issues. Um, once again, I would say that there's opportunity in the changes which are forthcoming to the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act with the community participation plans. Um, and I think the Department of Planning needs to take a leadership role um, to espouse what needs to occur to make it inclusive of all communities within um, our relevant local government areas so that that's espoused in those community consultation plans. Um, and lastly, I think we need to fundamentally rethink um, how we write planning legislation and controls. It is very legalistic, only planners can understand and I think we need to um, <laughs> make it a lot simpler so that all parts of our communities can understand what they can and can't do and be engaged at the right stages in the development and plan making processes so they can actually influence and inform planning decisions which will, you know, you know, benefit them in the longer term so you don't have issues once you get to a DA stage. Um, and as Jenny also said, I think we need to take a positive step in putting, um, making the cultural awareness and the values um, enshrined into our Planning Act and to take the lead from Queensland. And once that occurs, it will become more, will become a relevant matter for consideration in any planning decisions going forward. And I actually think that will, um, be of some value and assistance going forward. So I think we all need to work together. Um, this is not a problem that one person or one entity will be able to solve, um, but I'm sure that we can get there in the end. Thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, most of the points that I've written down have been very well covered, so it makes my job uh, much easier. And I want to take the perspective of what it's like um, teaching uh, in the university and working with up-and-coming planners. And um, uh, Nathan did, did mention that we're, we're putting a, a project together and I'll, I'll lead up to that. But one of the things that I have been learning myself teaching in planning, I, I used to be a development assessment officer at council, sorry, Nathan. Um, and I have worked with the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act for, for many years and I agree with its complexity. And my view when I worked in practice was that um, I wasn't going to be the naysayer at the counter saying to people, you've got to do it this way. I always thought the, the role of planners was actually to enable an outcome. And that, I think, reflects perhaps a culture w within the practice a practice of planning. So when I hear local government talking about, um, you know, taking a more uh, proactive approach and collaborative approach, this is what we're talking about um, in our classrooms, how we actually go about uh, doing that for uh, the community at large, but also for Aboriginal people. And the, the fact that the, the uh, Planning Institute of Australia has, has got um, some of the qualities embedded in accreditation, making us at universities delivering um, uh, planning programs responsible to do that. We need to be thinking more about how we embed stuff in our curriculum. And at, at Sydney, we are, are doing that, not just in, uh, in terms of our, our planning degree. We have two accredited um, degrees there at, at Sydney, but in uh, the school that I work with, in fact, tomorrow we're having a big workshop looking at, at, at everything that we do in terms of, um, you know, what we're teaching and, and how we're talking about things uh, to students and reaching out, I guess, in terms of the built environment, getting people to be um, more aware about those things. I certainly uh, agree with the first comment of the panel that we need more Indigenous people in planning, you know. Um, there, there aren't 
there aren't many. Um, and we do have um, a new student um, at, at Sydney um, who, who started at the beginning of uh, the year. So um, we've got, um, uh, looking forward to her uh, continuing and graduating and becoming a practising planner. And I think universities uh, have got that, that role of being able to enable um, more uh, uh, Aboriginal people to come in into our, into our classroom. Part of the, the training that, that the Department of Planning is doing, this train the trainer thing, getting out and explaining the complexities of, of planning. Uh, it's a shame we can't do that for, for just everybody in New South Wales. But um, to, to keep that uh, going, linking it with um, a university, getting the expertise out there. But I think this is something that um, should be supported, promoted and expanded to get more of this conversation and trying to explain, you know, the um, labyrinth that is that is planning, I think that's pretty good. But the one that um, I just want to finish off is this program that Nathan and 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 Peter have concocted, which is fantastic. We are um, using our um, graduate internship um, units, if you like, to give uh, five students. We might have more, but at the moment we've got five students who will be uh, working in the next semester. Uh, doing a lot of um, searches on the, the land, those 202 uh, pieces of land uh, that the Metropolitan um, Land Council uh, has, but also perhaps looking at some of those, um, uh, those title claims that haven't been resolved, trying to find, you know, if they're right here, uh, trying to find some more information out about that. But the other thing that I'm really interested in too is a, a forensic examination of perhaps some of those odd zoning decisions that have been made to see if we can work out where in the process this is this is happening, just to get some um, more evidence, more data out there so we can, you know, have a, a good conversation. But I think university has a big role in helping this. Thanks. Thanks very much. Could, um, I, I just invite Nathan to join the, join the panel. <laughs> and um, we just... I have an opportunity for um, some questions or comments from the audience to finish the evening. So straight up the, the aisle there. Hi, um, Karen Shellshire. And I just wanted to say thank you to Nathan because I think you've provided us extraordinary insights into um, a small hologram of what is happening at a national level. And um, I think you've put your finger on the dot. <laughs> and that um, it's not, it's uh, the things that you've spoken about in terms of raising awareness, education programs, etc. there may be 5% of the problem. The real problem is endemic racism that filters at the very roots of our regulatory system, that filters at the very roots of our thinking, that we're looking at how not to enable rather than how to enable. And I think this links up very well with the first research project that is looking at, well, how do you get through to change? Change has got to be directed at this massive endemic problem, the elephant in the room, that is um, a form of racism, that is in the semantics, it's in the laws, it's in the regulatory processes, it's in every single corner that has created a maze where Indigenous people are unable to move forward. And no one actually mentioned what about autonomy? What about this is their land? What about having autonomy in the planning and decision making over what happens in this land? Thank you. Could I just say thank you, Corinne? I, I, I find sometimes it's hard to call a spade a spade, given the history of this country and not dealing with its foundations real well. Given that I had the experience of going to Albuquerque in 1996 and being completely blown away by the, the big brother state of Australia called America, 
and having discussions with the Iroquois, and in that case it was the Pueblo's local land that we were on, how did your system work was the question that we all asked. How do you get rights? What's this treaty thing you got? What more importantly do you get under your treaty? To have that discussion in 1996 and be sitting here in 2017, it, it, it does feel very hard to not call it what it is. We need to address and deal with the endemic racism that it's occurred. And look, I, I, I suppose I can pull no punches. I, I've been raised like that as a guri. Um, an Irish father from Limerick probably just add ice into the cake. I could confer and say to you that most people's attitudes to me when I attend the community consultation for Ralston Avenue, they were quiet. But one comes straight out and told me what she thought and six or seven other people chose not to speak but left with her. She came straight out and said, listen, you abos deserve nothing. You're not from here. You've only been here just more than our people. I don't agree with anything that you're getting. Why should you get land? That was a proud local resident at Belrose, at the local primary school, giving me her heartfelt comments on a development application for us to utilise land to provide 156 residential lots in an area that we are told, or we understand, is in a dire need of new housing. But she made it her point to come and tell us how she feels that we shouldn't get it. And it was funny that, because one of those six who chose to speak after her had a very funny accent that I attribute to a Dutch boar accent, who also told me that, why do you get things? And I asked him, how long have you been familiar with Australia's continent community. And he said, what are you saying? I said, well, it sounds like you bring a foreign ethos to this place. Did you escape an ethos that was equality? Sorry, you're in Australia now in 2017. We're going through the same process as South Africa did in the early 90s and middle 90s. We're just unfortunately a little bit behind everyone. But I agree, it's racism. When I go into local governments and they choose and handpick Aboriginal people to be the spokesman for that area knowing I represent the actual authority of that area and when they need to destroy a culture and heritage article, they come to me. But when they want to pay someone to do a welcome to country, they'll wheel out their best friend or who they prefer. That is the disrespect that comes from institutionalised racism. They thinking that they'll choose who represents us and us not having the autonomy or the empowerment to speak for us knowing what we say and meaning what we say. So, yeah, it's an ongoing battle, but I've got to say, um, coming from the north coast of New South Wales, Edmund Barton's electorate, uh, we voted no in 1967 as a collective to giving us the right to be counted in a census. So if you're not aware, the electorate of Lynn, Port Macquarie, Kempsey, Warhope, voted no in 1967. 97% of them said no, to be honest. Racism is a huge problem in this country. Not many people wish to talk about it, but if you go up to Bar Colin, the actual birthplace of the Labor Party, it's the other local electorate that voted no in Queensland to the 67 referendum. So unless we're willing to be bold and deal with the core problem and only deal with the symptoms, we're not really going to get anywhere. So good on you for calling it out. And I'm glad you heard me say it earlier. I felt like sometimes I slip it in to see if anyone's listening. <laughs> We've got some, uh, some, some more questions or comments. Okay, just, just one or two. Thanks. Uh, a question I had actually sprang from your comment about the Pueblo and the like, and, and they're well known for being very successful in industry at Albuquerque. And that got me thinking, do you have examples of where the land you've used has actually garnered some industrial success for you or economic success? Yeah. And if so, what factors in that contributed to it? Well, I suppose our, our greatest success currently is utilising the day of mourning site. So we were able to negotiate, but it wasn't directly through land rights, I need to point out. That actually comes through a right that comes under the native title legislation. For those who don't receive native title, you can make applications to the Indigenous Land Corporation. So we used our entity to claim back a very valuable commercial asset but from a cultural community point of view, probably the most valuable asset in Australia. It's the place where that first meeting took place of a national unified movement formed. 
That provides us about 33% of our income today. It's really the backbone of our community. Unfortunately, but that's not the intention of what it was bought for. It was bought to be a place where we could celebrate and share our culture, a virtual keeping or cultural place. What's holding us back is we can't get any other income streams to make up for that. So unfortunately at this stage we're yet to realise a land claim purely based on New South Wales law being acquired, granted, then translated to a benefit. I'm aware of some land councils up in the north where I come from who have got licence and leasing arrangements on land that sees them get paid monthly dividends for using sand extraction businesses. My local community put it in trust from one land sale. They receive more fiscal income than nearly every land council in New South Wales. So there are some examples around. Gandangara currently has a proposal for a land development going ahead, which will hopefully put them into uh, long-term sustainability, but they're few and far between. Okay, um, look, it's, uh, we, we've run a bit over time. We might um, we might pull it up. So, can we really thank um, Nathan? Um, oh, yeah, thanks, fellas.